Welcome everybody uh, to this meeting of the Economic Policy Working Group at Hoover and uh, John Cock and I are co-hosting this and our guest is Kenneth Judd, this is our colleague and, and good friend. Ken is the Paul Bauer Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, he got his both his bachelor's and his PhD at Wisconsin. He's well known for many things, but one of my favorites is the optimal tax rate on capital is zero. <laughs> it's hard to understand, but it's good. But also numerical methods and economics and all sorts of things that we're, we're all interested in from the point of view of computation. So thank you. The, the title of the paper today is Optimal Dynamic Stochastic Fiscal Policy with Endogenous Debt Limits. It's joint with uh, Philip Mueller, who's on the uh, phone. I think you're in Zurich. Philip, I don't know. And uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, good. And Savinia Telkin, who's uh, we don't I don't see her, but uh, she's now dean of the of the business school at Simon in Rochester, um, PhD student from Stanford as well. So anyway, uh, by the way, I have to say, looking up, I had a fun time looking up people on the internet, and the and even better is the slogan from Rochester, even better. So Ken, do it even better and welcome. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, John, for this invitation um, uh, to speak to this group. Um, I must say um, I'm a bit hoarse. You know, for two years, I was in perfect health, no cold ever. And then a couple of weeks ago, I allowed a bunch of little people running around my house um, got a cold. I tested negative for COVID, but anyway, I guess we're getting back to normal, but I think, um, um, it'll be fine. So, um, this, okay. So. Now, what's the main question today is, um, how can governments use debt and coordinate debt and taxation in order to pay their expenses. And in particular, what is the debt capacity of an economy? Um, how much debt can it issue without uh, straining credibility? Um, and how does that affect fiscal policy? And now currently, for example, in the US, we have very large uh, and growing levels of debt. And um, but apparent, but but the market doesn't seem to be worried about uh, it being paid off when you look at long run interest rates. So can you reconcile those facts? So that, those are rough, the basic questions. Um, now, first let's look at some history. Both the, now when I talk about this topic I, in history, I like to think about just the US and the UK. Um, they both have used debt to smooth uh, uh, taxes over time. They borrow when there's a sudden increase in expenditures. Um, but of course, good reputations are needed in order to access bond markets. And over the last uh, 230 years, about the US and UK are the only major economies that have this consistent access. So um, uh, let's look a little bit at the history. Bordeaux and White showed how Great Britain financed its uh, 18th and early 19th century wars. Over time, you find out that tax revenues went up, but in response to the wars, uh, the United Kingdom seemed to like to get in a lot of wars. Um, but then how they finance it, well, these are the deficits um, of, of UK government spending. And uh, the, these, these cross lines are war years. And what you see is that, yes, when there's war, uh, there's deficit financing, balanced somewhat by small surpluses um, in, uh, during peace. Now, the U.S. Um, also follows that pattern. Uh, this is 20th century and in, uh, in, into this century. And again, this is debt to GDP ratio. And what we see is that World War I created a big increase in debt, which was partially relieved in the roaring 20s. Then came the depression, and then came World War II, pushed um, the debt to GDP ratio 
over one um, for a short while and then dropped, basically paid off via inflation and growth um, until then the Reagan um, years. Um, then there was declined again, but then boy, in this century, it's just been going zoom, zoom, zoom up. Now, uh, this has led some people to worry. Now, some people are scared when they see this um, because in particular, um, that doesn't even include the unfunded liabilities. Now, uh, people are like, oh, people like me, well, we're not so scared because we have the political power to make sure we get what we want. And then by 2050, uh, we're gone. So then, um, but now if you're one of the younger people in the audience, uh, if that picture doesn't scare you, then read some of Larry Kotlikoff's papers. So this issue of debt and how it can be dealt with and analyzed is, is important. Now, what I'm going to do in this presentation is um, point out, uh, it's going to be a, taking pieces from four different research projects. I'm going to first, first of all, I have to talk about the Barrow paper, and then I'm going to talk about how I extended it. I'm going to talk mostly about our paper, uh, the three of us. Um, I'll have to make a few comments about a very similar paper, um, but not dwell on it. And then um, basically the other thing behind all this is the development of methods for solving uh, recursive contracts or dynamic principal agent problems, the various jargon that we've heard. Now, what are the key papers? Well, in a literature review on optimal taxation, I always want to include Diamond Murley's. It's paper zero in optimal taxation literature. It assumes complete markets. Now, Aero Securities means that it's, even though it looks like a static model when you write down the notation, but it's a dynamic model when you put in Aero Securities, dynamic and, and stochastic. And in particular, Aero Securities could be tied to um, uh, shocks in, uh, or shifts in uh, taste for government spending. Uh, what are the results? Well, the key result is only tax final goods, not intermediate goods. The key thing that's relevant for our discussion today is that it says tax rates be, depend largely on elasticities. And if tax rates are not going to depend on contempor contemporaneous government spending, um, because the flux government fluctuations in spending, well, that's dealt with by tradings in the, these aero securities and risk, risk markets. So it is, it is really, it's, it's not compatible with the history. Now, so I think of this as sort of the history of the last couple hundred years now in search of a theory. And now Barrow presents that. He has this model where um, <coughs> you have um, based exogenous government spending. The only asset is a safe asset. So his, his is essentially a small economy assumption. The key thing is that um, that uh, raising taxes causes a social inefficiency cost of, uh, of C of T. Now, now with, because of that convexity, if there's no uncertainty about government spending, then you want to have uh, constant taxes. Even if there is some deterministic pattern to government spending, you want to have constant taxes. Um, and so then what Barrow did for analysis of uh, stochastic models, he basically used a certain equivalent approximation, assuming that the decision rule for the deterministic economy is then applied to the stochastic economy. And uh, this also is a first order approximation. So it's co very co common style in, in macro. And now what, what happens is that uh, optimal policy will imply that taxes and debt follow random walks you get tax smoothing. However, um, a, a, a couple of months ago, I was telling Philip, oh, for your PhD, the writing a P PhD thesis, you better read Barrow. And then I thought, well, that paper was written 43 years ago. And so I better also read it uh, because there's change in jargon and all that over time. And so I, I think this is about the, sort of the first time in a long time I've read the paper. And I realized that, yes, Barrow's claims hold if the cost of taxation is quadratic, which, by the way, is a specification that many people use. 
However, um, quadratic cost functions allow unlimited taxation, unlimited debt. Whereas if you wrote down a simple, any sort of simple microeconomy <coughs> and put taxes in it, there's gonna be a maximum level of revenue that's feasible. So the cost of raising revenue instead of being this nice mild blue quadratic is gonna be more like this red line with an asymptote at one, where one is normalized to be the maximum level of revenue. So then I thought, well, gee, let's look at what happens when you um, look at more realistic, um, more general specifications. And no, by the way, this Aldrid is a CR positive, okay, not negative, positive. It's a convex and increasingly convex function. And then I did a third order expansion in terms uh, relative to the standard deviation. And what happens is the first term is exactly as Barrow had that De um, debt tomorrow is debt today plus the innovation to spending, which is uh, mean zero. So the innovation is mean zero. So yeah, it's going to be um, random walk. However, the thing about random walks is that they are um, not dynamically stable, structurally stable. You if so, whenever you have an, a nonlinear system and you approximate it, and if the approximation is a random walk you know you have to go to high order terms. So I did, I went to the variance term and I found out that uh, um, this, this, you have this variance term. And so um, this is gonna be a positive number. And so basically variance creates a downward drift on the debt. Um, also um, skew, the third order term had, brings in skewness which have denoted lambda. So that also creates a downward drift if government expenditures are positively skewed, which they are. So basically the bottom line here is that in the long run, um, in this general barrel model, in the long run, um, you're gonna have a war, what we call a war chest. Basically you're, in the long run, you're going to um, endow government expenditures by <coughs> having negative debt, which means you're not in debt, it's all your taxpayers. They're in debt forever and ever to you. Now, so that, that um, now the intuition is clear. You know, if, <coughs> if there's an infinitely bad possibility in the future, you want to stay as far away from it as you can. And so you do that by reducing the debt to the level that you can self-finance all your expenditures. So um, we don't, in the general barrel, generalized barrel model, you don't get tax smoothing. Now, in 1980, there was big progress in this. Uh, Ternofsky and Brock and Kidlin Prescott both formulated um, optimal tax problems, optimal policy problems, as ones where you looked at the private economy. One state variable is the private wealth. The other state variable from the government's point of view is the marginal utility of wealth. And that's the dynamic process that governs the economy and then the and then the government treats those both as state variables um and then you use optimal control and dynamic programming and I, I mentioned this partly because in 1975 prescott had this paper um where he claimed optimal control wasn't couldn't use it for these problems i think john taylor was even at that at that conference made some comments um but anyway so i'm basically pointing out that Five years later, Barrow, Killen, I mean, Killen Prescott said, no, okay, the optimal control can do this. Tarnowski and Brock also said this. Now, Tarnowski and Brock approach was what we don't call the first order approach. This is the approach that's often used in the literature on recursive contracts, and it's used by Agari Marset, Sergeant Seppala. We don't use it because it um, has uh, substantial validity issues of reliability. Because when you have taxation, the objective function need not be concave and the constraint sets need not be convex. And so first order conditions may not be um, sufficient. So therefore we follow the, Kid the Kidlin Prescott approach 
which formulates things as a stochastic dynamic programming problem. And so the Bellman equation N is, a, is an optimization problem and it has to be a global op optimization problem, but it's, it's one way that you can deal with uh, this issue of, um, of, uh, of non-convexities. Now, the model that we use is one that you've seen uh, many times. Uh, the government issues <coughs> one period um, risk-free debt, flat rate on labor income, uh, no capital, governments can commit representative agent. The key difference between us and um, um, most previous papers is that we treat government spending as endogenous. Now, in the paper, um, we give some um, arguments for why that is the only sensible way to view even the US and the UK over the last, certainly the last century. Because World War I and World War II were not exogenous expenditures. They were chosen by um, the US and the UK. And uh, United, there was no necessity for the United States, for example, to enter into World War I. And in particular, I'll point to um, uh, Robert M. La Follette, who was born on a farm a, a couple of miles away from where I grew up. Um, and he voted against uh, entry into World War I, as did many other people. Uh, this was a policy decision that was made. World War II also was the outcome of policy decisions made by Churchill and Roosevelt. Uh, the Soviet Union, their expenditures, I would argue, well, I would be, they're exogenous. Um, but the rest of the combatants, it was a matter of choice. Um, and so I think, and we'll see that that's incredibly important in terms of analyzing the feasibility of debt. Now here, the labor supply is L, time endowment is one, normalizing it. Um, now, utility function is gonna be very um, simple, basic one you've seen before. Uh, nothing in our paper you, uh, use, uh, requires the separability. This is done for simplicity and also for comparability with other papers. Um, Non-severable preference utility functions are quite tractable. The key thing that we do here that's unusual is that we set the utility function, let's say to be a power utility function, but we have some C bar term here that's positive. The idea is that we do not want to put an anodic condition on consumption at zero consumption. We want the finite, the marginal utility of consumption at zero consumption to be finite. Now, people object to that, and I agree, perhaps if all of my consumption were zero, my marginal utility would be high. However, we're talking about the market, and not all goods are produced in the market, and not, not all time is done, is through the labor market. And so um, also, by the way, if you don't put in this C bar, then, then your, your revenue may be constantly increasing in the tax rate and, there's, and um, you could have nearly 100% tax rates without hitting the, the maximum revenue. And that's clearly unrealistic. Um, and so, I mean, even Sweden realized that having very high tax rates was not a good idea. Um, and so we try to incorporate that observation about reality into the specification utility function. Um, so we have a more sensible way of talking about debt feasibility. Um, now, um, everything else is very common. <coughs> Government spending and consumption are done linearly as a, as a um, output of labor. Proportional tax, we also have a transfer. By the way, transfers are absolutely necessary in order to keep this from um, going crazy. Um, because there will be some periods in some states of the world when you do want to issue transfers. And if you force the government to have ta to do some kind of taxes, then that's gonna mess things up. So ta transfers are a necessary part of any analysis. One weakness of this is that we don't um, allow for any local or state taxation or spending. Um, now this, um, 
so now in the United States, for example, interaction between federal and uh, state governments would be important. Um, uh, also, Germany in World War I faced uh, problems because um, the, federal, the, federal system, the federal government was, the national government had to compete with the states um, over revenue. So I'm abstracting from that. So in that way, I'm, I'm um, um, helping it be feasible for the government to maintain, to have debt. Um, there, and the debt is only one period risk-free asset. And that's the only asset in the economy, no capital. Now, um, the slides contain a variety of comments on the Igari Machet Sergeant Sepala paper. Um, I, I just, it's basically the same as ours, except the model is the same as ours, except we have endogenous spending, they have fixed. Um, we um, also, um, our solution method basically makes sure that the, um, imposes optimality at every point in time and, and state on the government. Um, whereas the, um, the PEA algorithm that they use just imposes um, uh, the first order conditions be true on roughly on average in some sense. Um, so, um, but we have, so we focus on, on having zero conditional errors in optimization. Um, now, what is our analysis? Well, I'm, I'm I, not Could gonna... I jump in for a couple, yeah. a couple well, of questions? I think well, I'm lagging behind uh, if it is a good moment. Yeah, what? Doesn't matter, but you're, I don't know if you're, feel free to postpone it. Doesn't matter the assumption of one period that I was thinking about some oh, durable no, monopolist. No, um, okay. One period, setting this, and cost uh, no. yeah. the, the debt issue matters if you're trying to, if you're worried about time consistency of optimal policy, then yes, that, that would matter. And that's what uh, Lucas and Stokey focus on in their paper. Um, I, do, um, the, I don't, don't, I, I don't know, I, I can't say for sure if it doesn't matter here. Um, but, um, I, but in that regard, that's the same. Um, I, I think um, the the, bear, the papers that don't focus on time consistency stay with this one period structure. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I have a paper with uh, Piaz Kubler and um, Carl Schmetters, what we exactly. talked about, uh, but um, that's, that's an equilibrium thing as opposed to optimality. Um, Another clarification so, very quickly is the separability of preferences is common. That does not matter. Okay. Does not matter for anything we do. It's just to make it comparable with everybody else. Um, so then now, so here's the thing: is that I'm not going to go through the equations because if you if you haven't seen them before, you're not going to want to look at them today. But the state of the system at every point in time, the government looks at the state of the system, the debt that it has to pay off today, the margin utility of consumption that people were promised and expected, and that you have to deliver on is part of the state. The spending is part of the state, the, uh, the spending state, which means that that's an index of margin utility of government spending. And then the government chooses everything in the economy, consumption, taxes, transfers, spending, bond purchases today, the price of those bonds, as well as what next period's uh, margin utility of consumption is gonna be for each, war and peace state, it chooses all that, but with the constraint that every agent um, agrees to do what the government tells them to do. That it, uh, all of these suggestions from the government are compatible with first with individual optimization. So this is just a standard revelation principle kind of thing, principal agent kind of construction. Can, can I get a clarifying question? Yeah. Yeah. How, how can this marginal utility be a state, but then consumption is a choice? I thought if you choose consumption- Oh, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's in this case with uh, severability, it's degenerate. With severability, it's degenerate, but yeah, um, yeah okay. But with non-severability, it's not. Okay. Yeah, so in general, that's why I say Lambda is the state in general, um, because it's a shadow price of wealth that's important. And uh, for our example, it could, and in fact, we'll do some pictures with C 
because it, it's equivalent, but not, not in general. Right now I'm doing the general stuff. Um, so, um, so, um, so it's a standard principal agent kind of approach or recursive contract kind of approach. And then we use dynamic programming to solve this. The objective function is the utility of the representative agent, including the desire for government spending. Now, um, there's a lot of computational challenges. Um, I think I've talked about them. The constraint set may not become convex. Um, we have to find the feasible set, et cetera. Um, the key thing is that uh, down here at the bottom, we have to discretize the state space. So you remember the value function, there's going to be some region which we don't know. We don't know what's feasible, but as the debt level gets close to infeasible values, the value function is going to go to minus infinity. So you can't just write down some quadratic or some low order polynomial to approximate the value function. Now, there are ways of dealing with this singularity, but the first cut really has to be to uh, discretize to see what that looks like. Um, so you have to discretize it. And in order to, and um, we first did uh, coarse discretizations of 200 by 200. And then, but uh, for most of the pictures, you're gonna see it's 500 by 500. And um, our results um, do not change much between those two. So um, we're confident we have what we um, need. And so that's what you're gonna see. We do dynamic programming, big, big, okay, that's, I've said that. Now then there's all sorts of equations I'm not gonna talk about if you, um, they're in the slides as a summary of what's in the paper. Um, and uh, so this probably, the slides are probably easier to read if you wanna look at the equations. General results. First of all, feasibility. Like I said, we can, we can analyze feasibility. We can find what sets are feasible. <laughs> and so when we take a very simple case um, and basically, by the way, um, our, our numbers are calibrated so that it's like once every, uh, um, I think once every 50 years you're in World War II and it lasts for three years. So that's, we have two states, peace and war, and the war is like World War II. Um, and so that's what our examples are calibrated to kind of represent US experience. Um, but then what we do is we, we look at the feasible sets. Now, this is going back to um, John's comment. Yes, because C and lambda separability, we can plot things in terms of C and B. And so um, here's a set of feasible B. So, if you're actually the feasible set is a set of B's and the shadow price or consumption. <clears throat> and what you see here is that if you're if in if you're in your state, if in the state where consumption is 0.4 and um, debt is um, five, then that's feasible. There is a set of policies, tax policies that um, fulfill all your financial. Uh, commitments, balance, budgets, et cetera, pays off all the debt. Um, if, however, you're out here at any consumption level in 10, that's not feasible. And that's because you have that much debt to pay off. See, the problem here is that you raised high taxes to, to pay off the debt. Well, then that's going to be lower labor supply. And also because we have a, a fine, a, a optimal, a maximum tax rate below 100%, then um, you see 10 might be possible if you could have a 100% tax rate and basically basically get everybody to work. Um, but no, we don't, that's not sensible. So for a sensible specification of the re revenue function, uh, 10 here uh, is not feasible. And we can compute exactly what that boundary is. By the way, if, pref if you have flexible G, this feasible set does not depend on tastes over G because you can always choose zero. So it doesn't matter how, how, how big a taste you have for war, how much you want government spending, this is the feasible set. Whereas if you have fixed G, 
Then we come to the case that if you have uh, uh, low wars, small wars, which basically, basically there's no war, this is war equals peace, then you have sizable levels of debt that's possible. By the way, five, by the way, the thing is GDP here is uh, about one third. So if you see, um, if you see the number five, that's like a debt to GDP ratio of 15. Um, so you can have sizable debt um, here if you basically, if you war equals peace, but as you increase the size of your wars, um, you find that it's not feasible to have any debt in these examples. And um, that I think it, it basically, again, going back to the intuition for the Barrow, General Barrow result, um, you know, if, if you got a string of bad luck and you can't reduce spending, you're not going to be able to pay off your debt. Now, we're going to show a, a, a contra. This is now we do a little um, introduction, a little contour plot for a simple example. Here, what we find here's government spending um, as a function of the C, comma B state. And what you find is that. In peacetime, this corresponds to the peacetime target uh, what, of 0 0.09. This corresponds to doing your full-blown war, 0 0.25. But notice that as, even in wartime, as the debt increases, spending decreases. Which, of course, this is all common sense, that as your debt gets higher and higher, you're going to have to pay off the debt, and you can't spend as much on war. Um, by the way, we have a utility function here, which basically makes it very painful to deviate from your ward target, but you are allowed to deviate. And since meeting the debt is absolutely necessary, you cut back on the war spending. Also, what happens is that if you start up here, okay, oops. The thing is, if you start up here, you're going to bounce down there. You start up down here, you're going to bounce in there. So we construct what we call the ergodic box, which um, is where, where, where life lives after a couple iterations. And so that drastically reduces the state space that we need to look at. And here's the government spending in that ergodic box. And again, what you see is that government spending basically goes to zero um, if debt levels are close to being infeasible. Tax rates are sensible but then as debt level goes to nearly the close closest gets close to infeasible levels tax rates get very high to um 70 percent um labor now <coughs> what happens here is that as debt level as debt level rises you you have to have higher taxes but that reduces labor supply which also then means you have to cut spending. And so again, uh, the labor supply is gonna be kind of small over on the, when you're close to the infeasible levels. And could I add, these are beautiful graphs and, and the word fiscal space suggests itself. I, just, what, I, what I read in this is when you have too much debt, your ability to respond to a shock is limited. Your model doesn't have any value to this government spending, but if you know, Saving oh, no, it we, important. You're not going to be able to do it if there's too we, much debt. We have value to government spending. That's in the utility function. But you're limited on your ability. But, so utility must too much debt then lowers the not the incentives but the level because yeah. it means you yeah. cannot respond when there's a civilization yeah. threatening shock. You can't respond because you got too much debt. Yeah, because and the thing is, paying off the debt is number one. Yeah. Because that, that's the fiscal space. That's the paying off the debt is, and this is why I insist. This is a if this is a model of anybody, it's only UK and US um, over the last couple of centuries. And we don't have defaults. There, there's an initial state contingent default. This is full commitment. No state yes, contingent yes, yes, defaults, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So this is um, now. Let's see the dynamics. Here's some pictures of where. Um, uh, and what's so here's suppose you start at debt here you and perpetual peace you you stay at that high level so what happens in these pictures is there's multiple 
um, stationary points under perpetual peace or perpetual war. There's no general tendency to go anywhere, which by the way, contradicts both um, um, AMSS and Barrow. This is an example of a time series plot for one particular draw. Um, and you notice that in this particular draw, it seems like debt rises over time. Now, I'm gonna now show off some dynamics. The blue dot is where you begin. So now, by the way, this axis now is lambda. So uh, this is marginal utility of consumption. So you take one over that and you roughly get consumption. So you start here and then what happens to <coughs> debt? Watch what happens to debt. You start, it bounces around. By the way, here the government, the people owe the government money. So they have some partial funding, but then what happens? You're up here, even though you start See, the war chest region is down here, but if you start with needing some revenues, then uh, things go nicely for a, for a while, but then things go bad. Now let's start, let's do look at another initial point. Um, um, where now here's the blue initial point. Um, and now initial, initial debt is negative one, which means the people of the government. Again, things look nice, but then whammo, they go bad. And basically uh, what happens is that this, this is what happens with all of these initial start points. Um, uh, things go nice for a while and then they go bad. Now, by the way, this is a simulation over a hundred thousand periods. Um, so uh, the, so what, so the, I get my, one, a lot of papers focus on station on, on the ergodic properties and talk about uh, uh, um, oh the martingale properties. <coughs> but um, my comment is summarized, and here's some here's some other slides. If your initial debt is here, then this is where you are at at uh, arbitrarily distant times in the future, kind of spread out. If your initial debt is 2.4, this is where you are. If it's 2.6, this is where you are. 2.8, this is where you are. Basically what happens is no matter what your initial debt is, you will at some time in the distant, in the future, possibly distant, be up here. But that means that once you're up here, you're stuck up here. And once you're stuck here, that means that you're gonna get stuck here. And once you're stuck here, you're gonna get stuck on the further subset here. Basically, asymptotically, we'll all be glad we're dead. This is 100,000 years from now. I don't, so this whole business about martingale properties and that just it is, uh, you know, maybe it's true, I don't, I, I don't care um, because what we find in everything we do is that all of these dynamics are very slow. Um, and for example, you can't appeal to any martingale properties to justify some stationary um, uh, econometric methods for studying this, um, because this, may, may, this, this isn't anything like what you need to justify stationarity in econometrics. Um, so basically, this is just one example. Now, by the way, how did we compute it? We computed it using uh, two, two, okay, 40 cores. Okay, this is trivial amount of computing power. Um, in some other, in another paper I wrote, we, uh, there were a few examples, each of which used 80,000 cores for five hours. And that was done eight years ago. And also eight years ago, in another paper with Shaveen and Young Yang, we used a one test run of 160,000 cores. So with this, um, I think we, we know we can do a lot more. The key results here, I'll summarize, no tendency to accumulate a war chest, which was the general barrel result and the AMSS result. Um, that was my 40, that was my timer going off. Um, and uh, long run, it looks like if anything, the long, long run is high debt and taxes, very slow dynamics. 
the it's very important if you have endogenous or exogenous spending. Um, I recently saw a paper by Tom that says, um, for purposes of tractability, we will um, assume that expenditures are exo endog exogenous. Well, that just blows everything up. I mean, that, the there's an enormous difference between the two, <coughs> exogenous or endogenous. Now, the next steps for this work is, first of all, um, my goal is that this satisfy the documentation requirements uh, that's typical in uh, computational science, uh, verification, uncertainty quantification, um, just as I did in the JPE paper. Um, we have some, some solutions. We, in some cases, we posted the solutions and the code that people could use to verify our solutions. Um, open source is not part of the standard requirement in computational science. Um, um, so um, it's often impossible to do copyrights. Um, my goal is to port this to third millennium computers. Because by the way, this is all of this is ideally suited for asynchronous parallelization, which is what is absolutely necessary if you're going to make use of, uh, let's say, Aurora, which will be the world champion computer, I think, by the end of this year. Um, now, getting that access is hard. Uh, um, maybe the Aurora people will let me have access, or I could add a nuclear war to the model and then maybe get some time from Sierra, which is uh, uh, the, war, the war guy's um, um, top computer. Or I have a Chinese friend who said his, his brother-in-law uh, works at a supercomputer center in China. But anyway, getting access to the um, computer power is, it is a matter of bureaucracy, nothing else. And there's many things where we can expand. I definitely want to, both Shavin and I have written on capital and taxation and want to do that. Um, heterogeneous agents are, is not going to be a problem once you incorporate tools that I and the Moliers and Young Yang have developed. Also, um, two um, methods that Carl, uh, Philip Renner and Carl Schmitt are used, and also uh, Murley style taxation in each period is possible now because of a recent paper of mine with some math people. Nash equilibrium bargaining processes now is also quite feasible if one has modern computers. So basically, I think this shows that you can solve these kinds of problems. Um, um, in a rigorous fashion, and that it matters um, that you have things like um, endogenous spending, and that um, you impose you be very careful about um, the, how you deal with um, the feasibility constraint and what debt levels in this case are feasible and what aren't, and we. But when we combine the advanced tools that we have, this is uh, this is this is tractable. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kay. You have a, just a quick question before we get started. The um, the the timing here is a little confusing to me. You talk about many years and lots of years. Everything was year, yes. <laughs> and uh, how do you you want? You, you want to think about an optimal fiscal policy because there is there a way to relate this to whether the debt is too big, too small? It just is a, a little computational issue which I'm having trouble with matching the the huge number of time periods and the and the optimality of the fiscal policy. Well, the the we solve for the optimal decisions for debt and taxes and spending given the utility function for um, spending because we did have G in the utility function. And so we solve out for um, that. Now the timing is um, that when you wake up in the morning, you know what war state you're in, you know then what Lambda you're in um, because the previous period's promises were contingent on the Z state. Um, so you wake up, you find out if you're a piece of war, then you, then you, you've agreed to a particular lambda contingent value for contingent on that, and then you pay off the debt, and then you issue more debt, and sell that off, 
and then and then decide what the lambdas are tomorrow. Okay. Perhaps that part I should have gone. I think with. so. So it, let's go on. We have uh, yeah. Elena and then uh, Mike Porto. Elena. Uh, I was wondering, Ken, if you could spend a few more words describing uh, uh, the limited describing discussing the limited distribution of debt. And what is the the stochastic the, process behind the the, the, the what the the, stoch the limiting distribution of debt that it looked uh, multimodal I think from the picture oh and, yeah uh, I mean the, basically all of these um, I we didn't plot the distribution I mean all of these distributions are going to be very dependent on what your horizon is yeah and um, that's why I haven't focused on, um, I, um, and also it's going to depend on, um, on uh, the, the, what your um, peace and war shocks were. So for example, if I, I, there's, we have lots and lots of pictures. If you have an above average number of wars, then debt's going to rise. If you have a below average of wars and it's going to tend to go down. Um, what happened is that yeah, we we had all these graphs and and um, how 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 do I summarize this? Um, because there's nothing, there's no stable results. And then what I realized is that, you know, the thing is that this this process is mostly transient, and so you don't have any nice, cute little pictures for what happens over various horizons. And, and then it's, it's essentially a transient process um, then and then ultimately getting sucked into these bad states. And that's what the message is of, of the movies and, um, <coughs> and this, like the movies, for example, there's no, the, the, the red plots of where the debt is, it's, there's no sensible pattern to that, it depends exactly on the initial condition and also the product. No, so I think um, that's why I'm skeptical of any attempt to, um, be, because this is all a very transient process, I am skeptical about any kind of um, attempt to estimate it empirically, um, particularly if you're gonna assume stationarity. Now, I will say this, that you, a lot of the pictures do look like when you put in some war processes on um, a lot of the pictures do look like the ones that um, um, Bordeaux and Whitehead. A lot of the pictures do look like um, like that. Uh, there's high taxes and spending and, and deficit spending and um, uh, during war and then less so. Now, by the way, one of the weakness, that one reason why there's some things on, in this model that I spend no time talking about because there's no capital stock. Because there's no capital stock, which is the case in these other models also. Um, and that means that there's nothing to pin down the interest rate. So because consumption is volatile because of peace and war, then your interest rates are gonna go flying around and the market values of debt are gonna be kind of strange looking. Um, so um, I don't focus on those things because without physical capital to pin down a marginal product capital, the interest rate fluctuation is gonna be nutty. Now, this is because we have a closed economy, but now if you're trying to think about the US and UK, well, certainly if you think about UK back in the, 18th and 19th centuries, I think closed is a, probably a good approximation. The US in World War II, it's a closed economy. Who else is financing our war? We're financing everybody else's war. So, um, so I think now um, when, if we did an open economy version of this, I suspect that will create, have more, more simp uh, simpler patterns. But again, and, and so now, if we have another war, the US is, I would argue, as I have some of you have heard me argue, US is essentially an open economy. And then this analysis would have to be adjusted to allow for that. So I, I think 
a lot of your questions about debt and all that, um, are, the answers aren't really interesting in this model because the interest rate is is not pinned down by any marginal product capital. That's right. Just a very quick follow up. So a related question was, what are the stochastic the properties of the stochastic processes that describe here that value answered a little bit well, well, describe that then taxes and sorry just just yeah, to conclude yeah. uh, you made a very important point and that this first order approach is ubiquitous but these problems are non-concave what what qualitatively and quantitatively um we are learning how 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 well, does it matter this, i couldn't unpack all of no all no of this. there's and the point is that this is there is no simple um description um, I mean, the thing is, the general barrel model does have some simple descriptions, but um, the, the general barrel model has an ex exogenous interest rate and um, other features. And so I think um, uh, I really haven't, there is, I, because this is essentially a transient process, I really am not, I don't, I don't think I'll find any sort of, um, simple description now the thing is that i if we had the computing power to do so then um there may be ways to uh, do simulations to generate um the kind of information that you're interested in but um but right now uh, uh we have the markup we have the markov transition matrix that represents exactly what you're talking about uh i don't see any simple patterns coming out of it. Uh, Mike Bordeaux. Okay. Uh, Ken, thanks for uh, showing my the pictures from my old paper. Okay. Ken, why why is why do you say World War II was was endogenous? I mean, did what what did we, you know, weren't we attacked by Japan? I, you know, I, I don't oh. quite get that. Okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, the um we were attacked by Japan, yes. But Remember that uh, we had already um, decided with um, England and Canada that we were going to get into the uh, war in Europe. That was a decision that was made in early 1941 um, by decision makers. Um, now, we got attacked by Japan um, and in fact, remember, Churchill was very worried that we were going to focus on Japan. And it was Japan that attacked us. Um, and, but so then he immediately flew over here and camped out in the White House to make sure Roosevelt didn't change his mind on the Europe, Europe decision. The other thing to remember in all of this is that um, Pearl Harbor was not the first loss of life in World War II for the US Navy. Um, the Germans sank a US ship um, in November, um, killing about 100 sailors. Um, so that was an outgrowth of our policy vis-a-vis -vis England. Um, and that, that we, and also remember that Churchill, basically his policy was to take back Europe from Germany. Um, and these were, these were decisions that were made. They're not compelled. Um, and uh, so there was a set of decisions. And by the way, the other thing that I only learned a few years ago, Roosevelt was trying to avoid a war with Japan. And then it was a screw up in American, he was willing to offer a deal. Um, with Japan vis-a-vis -vis China, and um, and then there's screw screw up. So, in terms of diplomacy, so yes, we were attacked, but the the it was unclear. You know, we were already decided to go into World War II, and um, and and so um, and the reason remember the reason Japan attacked us is that it figured that we would allow the Brits to use uh, Manila as a uh, base to um, support English um, attacks, uh, uh, attacks on Japan. So 
Um, I want to offer a referee this, this debate yeah, that, that, within the model. Uh, because yeah, necessity the, isn't isn't something, of course, that economists do. I think yeah. what a, a World War II buff would say is that the G, what we got out of it was not just some G government spending that enters in the utility function, but that in fact, um, uh, fighting World War II saved Western civilization. So in some sense, the G wow. in that case was especially useful in the utility function. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you're saying, well, that G was just a little bit, you know, good old yeah. fashioned G. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah. you know, I think that's yeah. that's a point that we don't yeah. necessarily have to argue uh, yeah. today. Whether it was just yeah. you know we we chose I, to fight a war and got some G, or we saved Western yeah. civilization I, got a lot of G. I I I don't dispute. I don't argue that um, that was a bad decision. I'm just this um, is not a fight we have to have. It's yeah, the yeah. Question of but what, what um, value do you get for your G? And I yeah. think people would yeah. say that you got and, a lot of value out of that G and you're saying maybe you didn't get so much value. And if <laughs> the basic point here is that if you assume that these expenditures are exogenous, then particularly for that level of expenditure, you can't come up, it's going to be very hard coming up with a theory that allows for significant positive levels of debt. So um, that's the uh, mismatch here, that if, if you view this as exogenous, then uh, you can't have a theory of positive government debt. Let's hear, let's hear from Sebastian. Sebastian. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Ken. Uh, great. Uh, I'm not sure how much I understood of everything you said, uh, except that I think I understood that uh, expenditure is endogenous. And this is related yeah. to what you were just telling yeah, yeah. John Cochran. Now, I and, and, and you were very clear from the beginning that your model is mostly the US and UK. I am really interested in, um, and, and this is another model, but what your views are um, coming from where I come and the kind of work that I do, I really would like to have that paying the debt is the endogenous decision here. Yeah. Um, and you're paying the debt all the time. And um, yeah. why? Well, mainly because the US and the UK sort of have always paid their debt, although I wrote a whole book yeah. arguing that we did have a default. Um, but what about if we turn this around and allow, because this is a concern going forward because yeah. of the picture you showed for the US. I mean, the debt to GDP ratio now is in the 200% or whatever. What happens if we allow for at what time, or, or, or will they default then from day one all the time? I mean, uh, maybe it also impinges okay. on whether your your debt is one period debt. Maybe you need longer debt for this to become interesting. So I'm interested in, in that okay. sort of expansion. I think, yes. Now, I the, this, this is the, this is the easy case where debt is, um, go, is debt is honored and the, um, and by the way, I, I've ignored inflation, which is a partial default, but um, that, but anyway, so basically this is the easy case. Now, what you're talking about is a case where people or governments may want to go to the debt market, um, but they can't, uh, but, the, but the lenders are going to be worried about the credibility of their ability to to pay off and willingness. So now you're talking about something that is not a direct optimization problem. You're now talking about something that's more akin to a game um, and building reputation. Now, um, the, uh, I pointed to a paper that uh, Shaveen Yang Yang Kai and I wrote on uh, uh, super games, basically computing all the Nash equilibria um, in a super game with states. Now, what we did there is we had uh, a model of where I think three firms and the state variables were uh, how many factories the production capacity was. But um, in, in the IO context, what you want, what a group of firms want to do is sort of move towards collusion and cooperation. And so what we, what we can show is how that process can evolve. And again, the thing is that it's a slow process of building tr trust in each, 
with each other. Now, that's the kind of machinery that could be applied, I believe, for here, for what your case is that you have a debt, you have a debt market, and but it's worried about the credibility of the of the borrowers. And so the borrower over time will have to take some actions in order to um, uh, in order to uh, get get that credibility. Um, also, a student of mine back in a long time ago, 90s, uh, James Conklin, had a PhD thesis, and um, he focused on, I believe, the issues, the problems that the, the Spanish were having a war in the Netherlands and using financiers in Italy. And so there are credibility issues, and he used some technology kind of like this to analyze that. So. What you're talking about is, is very much more of a game theoretic nature. But as I pointed to, uh, we, have the we, have the, we, we know how to look at those things. It's a matter of having the, uh, um, basically the raw computing power to actually apply those tools to the problem you're talking about. Because um, um, I'm sure there's probably some cheap ways of doing something, but one thing about this stuff is that simple models, you know, really, I mean, what this really shows is that simple models uh, are not terribly reliable in these things. Um, so yeah, I think we can, I mean, the problem you're talking about is more interesting in many ways, more re and relevant for many more countries, but uh, you have to model that uh, process of building reputation. Andy Filardo, Andy. Yeah, Ken, uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, the question I have maybe goes well beyond uh, the paper, but I was just wondering if I was thinking about um, guaranteeing or ensuring fiscal space over the medium term to be unchanged across generations. Here, just across time, because you don't have generations. <laughs> How far off from... <laughs> The optimum would you be? Is this is this really a completely outrageous kind of deviation from what's optimal, or is it you know very small in terms of, say, uh, GDP costs? Okay, I'm, I, I lost what your benchmark. I I am a I'm a very much a fan of of um, overlapping generations models, um, and I think yeah, uh, generational generational heterogeneity is important as I indicated. <laughs> I don't care about this stuff. I'll be gone before the bubble burst. Um, so yeah, that's that is an important aspect. Um, how far off we are, I don't know. Um, because even though people have finite lives, even if you're 70 years, I just turned 69. So even if you're 70 years old, you're, what's your expected lifetime nowadays? Um, and that number is, I don't know, 15 or something. Um, so many people, I think the vast majority of the population has an ex expected lifetime of 20 years or something. And then if they care about their offspring, if they have offspring and care about them. So when you're talking about that horizon, let's say being 20 or 30 years, you know, that's, that's a long time because, uh, what, even when you talk about the usual interest rate, you know, even within this model, the dis discount rate we have is I think, 0.95. So, you know, after 30 years, you know, it doesn't much matter. Um, so I, I don't know how far off we are, perhaps not as much as a, if you did like a three period overlapping generations model, then this would just be nonsense because everything would fall apart there. But um, no, I think, you know, uh, the time time horizon for most people that they care about is enough that this shouldn't be too far off. And that's just that's just a rough guess. But again, you give me some uh, computing power, and I'll put in overlapping generations. Okay, thanks. Any other any questions or comments? Or we should thank Ken. Thank you so much, Ken. Appreciate it.